Hey, friends, and welcome to the Happy Hour with Jamie Ivy podcast. I'm your host, Jamie, and I'm so excited that you're here with me. Every week, I invite a girlfriend to join me on this show, and we chat about the big things in life, the little things in life, and everything in between. Before we get to our guest today, I want to thank one of the partners for the show, and that is EM Jewelry Design. After graduating with a BFA in Jewelry Design and Metal Smithing from Texas Tech University, go Red Raiders, Ellen Moat found a job working for a jewelry designer in Portland, Oregon. However, when her husband's job led them to Waco, Texas, go Bears, uh, it became clear to her that if she wanted to continue working in the jewelry industry, she was going to have to do it on her own. So Ellen did what I love when women do is she started her own company. Ellen started EM Jewelry and Design in the fall of 2015 and has since launched her original pieces on her website, emjewelrydesign.com, and has been featured in the Magnolia Journal as one of Joanna Gaines' gift guide picks. Ellen's heart behind her work is to encourage, inspire, and empower women to pursue their own God-given passions. Right now, Ellen has a great deal for you Happy Hour listeners. Go to her webpage, emjewelrydesign.com, and you can save 10% on your next purchase with the code Happy Hour. Guys, you're listening to episode number 129, and my guest for today is Rebecca Lyons. Rebecca and her family live in Nashville, Tennessee, and she just released her new book entitled, You Are Free, Be Who You Already Are. Today, Rebecca and I tackle the fashion that she can pull off and I am running very far away from, the message of the freedom that we already have in Christ that she writes about in this book. We talk about handing out grace towards those that look different than us, different than our families, how seasons of transition can give doubt a big place in our hearts, and her upcoming tour that she has with Christy Knuckles and Ann Voskamp. It was great to chat with her today, and I know that through our conversation, you're going to leave inspired, encouraged, and pointed to Jesus. If you're listening and you want to send us a message about anything, you can find us over at Twitter. I am at Jamie underscore Ivy and Rebecca is at Rebecca Lyons. Also, I love to see your pictures. I love when you post pictures on Instagram of listening. Instagram, I tell you guys all the time, is my favorite social media outlet. And I am at Jamie Ivy there. Guys, also, I have some good news about the happy hour event. I told you last week, if you would listen to the interview with Julie Manning, that uh, Saturday night was sold out. Well, I have some good news. Listen at the end of this show um, and I'll tell you about that. Also, just so you know, If you're listening to this, we're almost done with February, which is crazy, right? Also, this is the last show that airs before I turn in my book manuscript. Oh my gosh. Yes, you heard that right. Next Tuesday, the 28th, my first ever book manuscript is due, and I could scream for joy and cry big, big, sloppy, sappy tears at the same time. I'm super excited over the next few months to get to tell you more about this project. All right, guys, here is my conversation with Rebecca. Hey, Rebecca, welcome to the happy hour. Hey, Jamie, how are you? I'm good. I am super excited to chat with you on the show. Uh, I actually just saw you a couple weeks ago at IF, so that's fun. Oh, that was Um, fun. And you gave a phenomenal message on stage in a phenomenal jumpsuit. That's that's what I remember. (laughs) You know what? It is all about the jumpsuit, ultimately. (laughs) I'm telling you, there are people that can wear a jumpsuit, Rebecca, and you can do it, so... I, you know what? I think I looked through my closet recently and there's about eight of them hanging there. And Are you I did, serious? I didn't realize that I had this thing. It's hats or jumpsuits. I have a thing. It's an issue. Have you and, always loved jumpsuits? Because that's the question I need to know. No, okay. no. But, but it does kind of rock back to college days when we, the jumpsuit then was the overalls, right? Oh, you of know? course. Yes. Um, and then growing up, in my upbringing, a uh, little known fact is I wore culottes. Uh-huh. You grew up in a Baptist church, didn't you? <laughs> yes, of course. Yes, of and, course. and culottes are like when shorts are trying to be a skirt <laughs> yes. and it's just not really working. Right. But I, I think the jumpsuit is kind of my throwback to like all things baggy around my legs. <laughs> it just makes you feel comfortable. <laughs> yes. It's like pajamas. See, the reason I don't think I can do a jumpsuit is because I need all things baggy around my middle. Okay. And so the jumpsuit, I think, is not the best thing for me to try. Right, because it, it tries to hug your waist. Yes. And then it's like for me, who's like pear-shaped, it's like all things are great around the hips because uh-huh. it's all loo- mm-hmm. loose and baggy. Mm. Yeah. See, I, I need I need a different kind of um, jumpsuit, jumpsuit <laughs> than that. I need one that comes with like a, like a big like loose top, and then it can like have a, a jumpsuit underneath it. Like a maxi jumpsuit. Yes. We're on to something here. I don't create clothing, but somebody might a maxi jumpsuit. Yeah. There you go. There this is the go. best. Basically, it'd be like what we put our little girls in when they have on a dress with like 
pants underneath it or shorts underneath right. it. That's what I would look like. I would look <laughs> totally. nine. Nine is what I would look. I love it. I love it. Oh, okay. Well, back to being serious. Um, I know I told you then, but I really, really enjoyed what you what you brought to us at If uh, from Axe and all that. So it was great. And so thank you so much for being there. Um, okay, we're recording this a day after Valentine's. So even though this is not coming out until the week after Valentine's, we're talking the day after. Do you and Gabe celebrate Valentine's Day? Well, celebrate is an operative word. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we, I had to actually travel to Atlanta for a couple of days. I was speaking at a retreat. And so he came along because he's like, I kind of like where you have to speak. This venue looks nice. And I never normally get to travel with you. And so that was our quote unquote Valentine's celebration. Him hanging out and going golfing while I'm working. <laughs> That's the best though. That is literally the best. Yes. So we did get to have like, coffee and talk and have a little like quiet space before the crazy of next week hits. So in my mind, that was full on celebration. <laughs> that was full on. We just had some friends over and just did like a normal, it was like a normal day. There was nothing Valentine's about it, but that's kind of how we roll. But yeah, yeah. Same whenever, here. whenever Aaron and I were first married and he used to travel a lot, he was at a band and they would lead worship for like college events and disciple nows, all those type of things. I would get invited to come with him a lot. And at the beginning, I was the only wife. And then I was the only wife with a baby. And believe it or not, young moms don't realize this, but traveling with a little baby, although they have a lot of stuff, is actually quite easy. I mean, they just mm. lay there. I mean, you know. So yeah. when we had a young baby, I would get invited to go with him. And I would only go with him if they were at a beach. That that was my oh. standard. <laughs> like. Is there a beach? Okay, good. I'm in. I would love to right. come minister with you. Nope, not at a beach. I'm going to stay home. I just had really, really high standards for getting in an RV and traveling with a bunch of guys. Yes. But if there was a yeah. beach at the end of the road, I was in. Always, always. Completely, yeah. completely. If, if there's an ocean view, I'm in. I'll say yes. I'll say yes every time. <laughs> me too. Me too. <laughs> um, okay, Rebecca, you are, you just released or you're just about to release. In fact, let me look at my calendar, and this is how professional I am. Is your book comes out on the 20th? 21. 21. So Tuesday. When this show is airing, when people are listening to this, your book came out the day before. Yay. I know. Fun. So tell me this. It's your second book, so that's like your sophomore book. Am I right? Yes. Is it any less scary? Well, you know what? It's kind of like the remedial sophomore schedule because it's four years after the freshman mm -hmm. book. <laughs> I got it. I got it. <laughs> Imagine you were going to college for 20 years. This is, <laughs> this this is, is it. a sophomore book. <laughs> so maybe you uh, forgot how hard it was. Yeah. You know what? I blocked it from my memory, and then it all came full circle about 12 months ago. And I was like, oh, wait, I really do have to do this, don't I? <sighs> it's interesting because the first book, Free Fall, I had never planned to write. Uh, I definitely had never planned to speak. I just had a, a story to tell from the year prior in 2011, moving to New York and kind of having whiplash, you know, mm -hmm. just this crash and burn moment, panic disorder set in for over a year. And the Lord kind of met me and got real loud in that season. And so when 2012 came around, I wrote that story and it kind of poured out quickly. It, and it's not normal, but from start to finish that whole book season that from, from, writing to release was 10 months, which is that unheard is not of. normal. No. So, yeah. but, so I had a very tainted view of reality <laughs> and I was like, Oh, this is so easy. Right. Right. Um, so that was done and then took about a year and I decided, yes, there's something new stirring in my heart around this idea of freedom. Uh, the first book's more on an outer healing journey and this new book on freedom is more of an inner healing kind of journey. Mm -hmm. And so I think sometimes we, we focus on the externals and the symptoms of things, and we, we, we attack those first because that's what we can see. And then later on, we learn, oh, wait, there was actually a root to that. Mm, right, <laughs> there was, right. There was, there was kind of a story behind the story mm -hmm. um, from earlier on in our lives or wherever wounds began to creep in and lies we began to believe about ourselves as a result. And so those, because they're hidden and they're layered and usually we kind of, 
we operate out of them, but we never actually acknowledge them. Uh, so this took three years to, mm. to truly process and unpack and wrestle down. Um, and so that's why this is literally the hardest thing I've ever done. This mm. book, I, I, my husband will tell you, like many times I would just threaten to just quit and just like a baby, like mm-hmm. a complete p- pity party. Yeah. But um, what's so sweet is we delayed the book. Um, and we just, it just kept pushing back and I, I'm grateful now, um, because who would have wanted their book to release the week after the election? I mean, seriously, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good thing. Who would have thought uh, that was long before I knew right. even who was going to run in the election. Exactly. So, exactly. You know, I trust it all. <laughs> you trust it all. Well, I mean, I actually just got your book in the mail yesterday. Thank you so much for sending okay. that to me. Um, but I had seen it at the if gathering. I saw it on the shelf and I've seen it online and stuff. And I, it, this is a big thing for me. I always tell people, I love the cover. Mm. It is so beautiful. Thank and it's you. got this raised texture to it. I'm rubbing my hands on it right now. Which <laughs> everyone's going to you have to buy one, not like the Kindle. You got to buy it so you can feel it because it's that's embossed. a big deal to me. I know. Um, but I flipped it over on the back. And although I did, I just flipped in randomly and read a chapter last night because I just got your book yesterday. I knew we were going to be chatting today. So I'll talk to you about that one chapter that I read, which that's what we get to talk about because it's the one I randomly picked. So we'll go with that. Oh, good. But um, the back, I read it and I thought, this is what we need to hear. It says, Christ okay. doesn't say you can be free or you may be free or will be free. He says you are free. And then yeah. you write, do you believe it? Um, and do you believe it now? I mean, I, I'm assuming that you do. You wrote the book, right? Um, yes. But is that that four-year journey of believing that? Yes. It's crazy how hard it is. You can hear something and read it and say it until you're blue in the face. But until you come to know it mm-hmm. and rest assured in it, I think that changes everything. It doesn't mean that doubt won't try to, you know, rear its ugly head or, mm-hmm. you know, you think of the enemy or Satan in the garden was always questioning Eve, like, did God really mean it when he said? Mm. And so that's not going to stop for us today. He's still going to try to get in our ear and go, did, did Jesus really mean it when he said it is for freedom that you are free? It's right. <laughs> right. I, I did all these things. So it's not that we're never going to be plagued with that question, because as long as we're living and breathing, we're going to be tempted by mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Because we do carry freedom, and he hates that. But um, but we can now, you know, the more we come to know this and and really rest in it, uh, we can respond and going, yes, this is true, mm-hmm. and and this truth uh, supersedes even the way I feel right now or what I'm experiencing right now, because the truth is the truth, mm. and it's the truth. <laughs> so That's... I can I can own that. I can actually claim it. When mm-hmm. I don't always feel it. Yeah. For me, I'm thinking when you're talking through this, I was just having a conversation with some ladies recently about like actually choosing to believe what God's word says about us to be true. And that this would be a point that he says, you are, you're free. I, I tell you that this is true. So then we have to like really choose. I'm, am I going to believe this or am I not? Um, mm-hmm. And for me, a lot of it is like with my identity, like who does God say that I am? And mm-hmm. so that's been my journey for like, you know, 12, 13 years of really saying, and I think like you just said, yes, I believe it. I think on the other end of my journey, I can say, I do believe I am who God says I am. Now I have to remind myself of that a lot. You know what I mean? And so it's not like, I love that you like people are thinking, Oh, once I believe this, then I never have to struggle anymore. That's actually not true until we meet Jesus. Like (laughs) this life is full of struggles. Um, But sometimes I think like you're saying, we have to just, we have to tell ourselves what's true all the time. Absolutely. And time. tell each other what's true. Yes, yes. Oh, I know you have your people and I have my people. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I put out an SOS text yep. and say, <laughs> you guys, I'm starting to actually believe that my worth is only attached to what I do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and when I feel like I fail, then I take it very personal, like mm-hmm. I'm a failure. And, and that's exactly what he wants. He wants us to just spiral and like flatline. And I, I, there was a day in December, I sat in the bathtub and like stared at the wall for too long. And I just remember thinking, right now is about the time I need to be texting my people. Mm, yeah, this is it. <laughs> yeah, like come around, like not even physically, but just please pray right now. Like mm-hmm. I feel like I'm coming under the gun of 
just fear and doubt and all the things that he would want us to feel when we are trying to carry a freedom message. And as believers, that's what we are all doing. We are carrying a message of freedom that is counter to what what other people would believe. And right. so when we carry that, we've got to understand that there will be opposition to it and we have to actually lean into each other for just life giving, like speaking truth over each other. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes we all take turns on who's feeling that strongly that day. <laughs> That's exactly right. And in my, a lot of my girlfriends, I don't know how your circle is, but a lot of my girlfriends have considerably younger kids than me. Hmm. I have one of my closest friends who is pregnant right now. And I am so far from that, you know, like that is yeah. A, yeah. a decade over a decade for me ago. Um, but I love it because so many times I get to be that person that reminds them about mm -hmm. their identity or their freedom or just that like, you know what, there will be a day like they can hardly believe this, but there will be a day where you and your husband will leave the house and they'll all stay home like all the children. Right. I know. <laughs> and you won't have a babysitter. Oh. They'll be there right. by themselves and they'll survive and they'll make them yeah. sandwiches and watch TV yeah. and play outside and you come home and everyone's happy. Um, yeah. So I yeah. love having girlfriends around that can like speak truth over God's truth, but also just like, hey, listen, sister, there's going to yeah. be a day. This is going to mm -hmm. be different. And yep. it's so great. Oh, it's so great. It is. Are it some is. of your close yep. friends still having babies? Yes. Well, um, my sister's having a baby. She was due yesterday. And so oh my she's, gosh. she's feeling it. She's like, <laughs> they're not even giving her um, a date to C-section for a whole nother week. So she's like, you know, we were just joking because we really know how to bake them. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> babies like never want to come out of us. So my sister is, but I also have uh, celebrated a dear friend of mine who's my age, but her daughter turned one on Saturday. And oh. and it is wild. We're kind of like, how are we all in <laughs> all these seasons at once? <laughs> but it's so fun, isn't it? I mean, it is. Because it is. you can build and learn and just mm -hmm. trust off each other. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of kids, okay, you have three kids. Mm -hmm. um, how old is your oldest? And then tell me the ages down the line. Yes, yes. So Cade is my oldest. He's 16. He is a freshman in high school, which is crazy town. Mm. And Pierce is in eighth grade. He's 14. And Kennedy, my daughter, my only daughter, is 11 and a half. She's in sixth grade. So okay. middle school and high school. No more elementary for us. I just went yesterday to, I have... Um, two 11 year old boys and then a nine year old daughter. So she still has two more years of elementary school. But I went to my boys last Valentine's Day party yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and I was not sad, Rebecca. I was not sad no. at all. I was like, no. let's move on. Keep mm -hmm. moving. I, elementary, I am happy to put it behind me, honestly. Yeah. Like, I. Here <laughs> Here's the difference with middle school Valentine's. You do not have to prepare a single Valentine for a single class party. Instead, what your kids do is they decide they want to go to Target the night before and get a little Valentine for their quote unquote <gasps> middle school mm. crush. Oh my goodness. It's a new day. I'm like, sure, I'll buy you those lollipops to give to that cute girl. Absolutely. <sighs> because we're and not all around the table at 930 that, at night asking no. how to spell someone's name. <laughs> I know, it, like <laughs> texting our friends for the class directory. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, yeah. we just, we just, I mean, we just did all of that and I'm not going to miss it one bit, but no. I'll tell you this. Uh, so I, we came home from school yesterday and my, one of my 11 year old boys was holding this um, Houston Texans mug. Okay. So he likes that football team here in, in Texas mm -hmm. and it's full of candy. And I was like, did one of your classmates pass that out? I mean, I'm thinking that's like a hundred bucks worth of stuff to all the <laughs> classmates. And my other son was like, no, Claire gave it Ooh. to him. And I was like, oh, <gasps> what That's, is this? I know it's a thing. It really is. Like both my kids came home the day before Valentine's and they're like, we each have a Valentine. I'm like, like, like an actual Valentine. Like I'm just trying to get my head around it. <laughs> oh my gosh. It is so crazy. It is so crazy. Yes. But I, I'm ready to put the elementary behind me. That's for sure. Yeah. Amen. Um, okay. So Kate is your oldest and I know that Kate has Down syndrome and you just, I watched this video 8,000 times that you guys just gave him as something super, super special for his birthday. And literally yes. I watched it over and over and over again because it was so exciting. Um, <laughs> so you guys gave him his own amazing, I'm not going to call it a bike because it has to have a different word. Is it? Yeah. What it's is a, it? You know what? Um, we said every 16 year old should have their own set of wheels. And, uh -huh. but you know, I say that wheels, you know, loosely. And uh -huh. so we got him, um, 
it's a tricycle Schwinn that stands really high, like a regular height of a 10 speed. Uh -huh. And then in the back is this huge basket for delivering. Like he could literally have his own food delivery service or I could sit in the basket. It's that big. <laughs> okay. So I told him, I just said, you can haul mom around or you could go work for Tzatziki's, like whatever you want to do. But, um, so he, he only started riding a bike a year ago when we got him a lower one to the ground mm -hmm. called Mobo. There's a lot of adult, like cruisers, three wheelers that people race on. And it's great for kids with special needs who have a hard time balancing mm -hmm. on a two wheel bike. Right. And so last year was the first time we could do family bike rides on vacation or around our neighborhood. So he loved it so much. He started riding an hour a day and would always want one of us to go with him because if we didn't, he would wind up on like, you know, a major road. Right. Just like a highway and, in Nashville. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we can't have that. So we'd always have the little flag up high and there's, where's Cade? Oh, he's, you know, run off. And uh -huh. there's, the, there's the orange flag going down the road. Somebody catch him. So this time we got him a higher one um, and we rolled it out on his birthday in his party. So that's the video you saw. And he was just like, he literally beelined to the bike and started riding it down the hall in our foyer. And I was like, okay, that's going to crash into right. things. We're going to have to get outside with this. <laughs> okay. Well, Rebecca, I just figured out how you wear these jumpsuits. You ride How? a bike for an hour <laughs> all the time with your son. Oh, my goodness. I know. It's kind of like he's forcing us all to get in shape because we can't great. let him ride alone. I mean, even he did. You know, like kids with special needs that aren't as mobile, they tend to put on weight in their teens mm -hmm. because – they just don't have the yeah. endurance uh -huh. and they, and, and they're like us. They'd rather eat chocolate and yep. watch TV. Hello. <laughs> right. Yes. Who I wouldn't? Mean, who can, who can argue with that? But this became, I mean, he got so into it. He lost like 15 pounds, Wow. Last, which was crazy. So anyways, and, and as a result, we've all probably lost a few pounds. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. <laughs> and it's great family. I have one of my, my closest girlfriend in the world. Um, her daughter uh, is not, not doesn't have autism but she's on the spectrum you know all the all the words mm -hmm. um, but they too just got her a bike like this rebecca and she mm -hmm. loves it it has a basket yeah it has three wheels and it is just her most favorite thing in the world so and it, you know what it is is they feel independent yeah and they feel like they're able to do what everyone else is doing and that's so big for their confidence and mm -hmm. self-esteem and just a way to participate with peers and friends. It's just, I highly, highly recommend it to every special needs parent. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that is good. I know I have a lot of listeners too that I've written in that have really enjoyed when I've had um, a guest on who has spoken to their heart because they're in the midst. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of them have a lot younger kids than you do as well. So I'm sure you remember mm -hmm. being a mama um, of a young child um, who has special needs, um, what were some of the just greatest things that your friends rallied or did or said, or what back, go take yourself back to like those first five years. Like what are some like of the that. best things that your friends did? Um, just to encourage you in some days that kind of felt kind of hard and overwhelming. Oh, that's such a good question. You know, I think we were just included on everything, whether or not Cade could maybe hang the whole time or, comprehend exactly mm -hmm. everything that was happening. The biggest thing kids want, no matter who you are, is eye contact and, and just a level of engagement and conversation, putting yourself on that child's level, two, three, four, five-year-old. And all my kids were all, or all my friends were always so great at getting down on the floor and looking Kate in the eyes and just asking him questions. And he mm. would, he would just light up and just respond with words they could or could not understand. And sometimes I would have to translate. I was mm -hmm. like, he's saying, yo, you means love you. And, oh. um, and then, he, you know, the nonverbal goes really far anyways, right? He's yeah. just leaning in for a hug and a kiss and he might nuzzle in your bosom if you let him. So you kind of have to have some ground rules. But um, it's just really sweet, like how affectionate um, all kids are. And mm -hmm. so when I saw my friends doing that with him, it it just reminded me we should be doing this with all our friends' kids. Mm, yeah. <laughs> we should always get down on their level and ask them about their day and wait and let them respond and ask a little bit more. Um, it's such a gift to to just help mother hen our friends' kids, like yeah. you know, and yeah. it doesn't change doesn't change based on their ability. So. Right. And I would imagine that um, Pierce and Kennedy have a sp 
kind of different outlook on the world and um, having their oldest brother, um, you know, have special needs. And so I, I always see that it's joy for me to have my friends um, around all of my kids because uh, mm-hmm. my, my family looks different. You know, I have three black mm-hmm. children and so we look different. And so our family kind of stands out a little bit. And I'm sure that yours kind of stands out a little bit sometimes um, with the differences in your family. But I feel like it's like God's using it in my kids' lives as well. Have you seen that in Pierce and Kennedy? Oh, man, absolutely. It's all they've ever known, yeah. you know. And it really didn't affect our family till we moved to New York City when Cade was nine and Pierce was seven and Kennedy was four. It was the first time they heard a child actually make fun of Cade because, you know, growing up, Cade was Cade and yeah. we didn't even really discuss Down syndrome. It wasn't uh-huh. like we weren't trying to, but we just didn't jump to the label. It was more yeah. like Cade learns differently. Mm-hmm. It takes him longer to pick up some things, but this is what he does do that's harder for other people. We would always kind of focus on everyone has different abilities. And so when we got to New York, we had to really unpack like that people who haven't known Cade his whole life, that's the first thing they notice then mm-hmm. is, is kind of the outward thing because they've never gotten to know him on the inside. And so they got so defensive. Oh my goodness. On the playground in Central Park, I will never forget. I was like, okay, Pierce, you got to understand that some of these kids that might say unkind things just haven't been exposed Mm. to kids like this. They're speaking because they just don't understand. And it would be really easy to get angry at them, but it's better just to say, you don't understand. And let me tell you a little bit more about Cade and just it. It's easy to say that for me because it's been 16 years. Mm-hmm. Trust me, I, yeah. I got mad. Yeah. <laughs> Plenty of times I, I would, you know, want to kind of rear up. But I've learned over the years that it's just grace and it kind of comes from a place of people who just don't understand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They've we, not been we, exposed to it. We feel the same way sometimes when people haven't seen and it comes out most with young because kids are just they're going to ask questions. And when they see something that's different and a lot of times, especially when we moved into our new um, school district that we're in now, a lot of them haven't seen black kids with white parents and, you know, mm. and so they're just confused a little bit. Like I've mm-hmm. actually never seen this in my entire life. And mm-hmm. so it is a p- matter of just like, they don't understand. Let's educate them. I think that we mm-hmm. could all take a little bit of that in our hearts, Rebecca. Yep. It's just <laughs> grace and yep. education. Yes. Right. right. Um, okay. So speaking of New York city, that's kind of the chapter that I read, but I'll tell you that New York city has a dear place in my heart. Aaron and I honeymooned there. 16 years ago. Yes. Um, And so we've been several times since then. And in fact, just this last holidays, we got stuck there. It was, we were coming back in from Spain and all the airlines shut down. We were supposed to leave on a Saturday night. And um, I think I told you this at if, and then we didn't leave until Monday. Um, Yes. And everyone was like, oh, that's so much fun. And I was like, no, it's not fun. I want to be home. So, uh, but New York City (laughs) is so fun for me. And It's crazy when I read when I read the chapter that I read about you guys moving from Atlanta, you know, you're both raised in the South, Southern people, and then you pick up and you move your whole family of five to New York City. And I'm guessing because I've been in New York City, you were in a small apartment. Am I right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So there had to have been a thousand transitions, but please tell me that was one of the hardest because it seems one of the hardest to me. It was the first two years we were on. Um, like in a couple levels of a townhouse. It was still small uh, on the Upper East Side. The, the issue with that apartment is that there was a mice problem, there Mm-mm. a mouse problem. <laughs> no. There were mice. There were plural. Uh, we counted <gasps> no. for about two years. It, we were up to in the 60s for how many mice we killed. So like killed. mouse traps. So that's one. That's not like sightings. No, like killed, like oh my 62 gosh. mouse traps to the curb with mice in them. So <sighs> as you can imagine, like I, there was, there was no safety zone. <laughs> oh my so, gosh. So then we moved from that downtown to um, a much smaller, newer building, uh, an apartment with a thousand square feet. Well, they were both small, but this one was a two bedroom and all three kids lined up in the master like the three bears. I mean, we, we basically from wall to wall could fit three twin beds with about a foot in between each bed because we were like, um, these kids are, uh, you know, at this point, uh, let's see, seven, nine and 11. Uh-huh. And, and everyone kind of needed their own like twin bed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> But Kennedy was sandwiched between the boys, and we were all very, very close. We had a, uh, you know, probably a circular table from Ikea that we all five squeezed around, and then we had a single couch 
that we got, you know, like a floor sample or something at Pottery Barn and literally put it on top of our van and drove it to our apartment. And that was it. That was our furniture. And, oh my um, gosh. Yeah. It made cleaning really quick. For sure. <laughs> Clean up. Done. Yeah. Three minutes. Oh, so. my goodness. So who lives? I mean, it is so crazy expensive to live in New York City and have you, you're does anyone have bedrooms for all their children? No, 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 it's no. It's just so Never. uncommon. No, yes, absolutely. Even two bedrooms is the norm. Um, if you do three, you're adding a couple thousand a month to your rent <gasps> for oh one gosh. extra bedroom. It's not like you're adding a couple hundred dollars. No, you're you're almost like doubling your rent to get to a three bedroom. That so, is so crazy. So yeah, you just kind of you just pick your battles. <laughs> a lot of people have bunk beds there. Let's I just bet. Say. We were talking yeah. with someone um, a couple of years ago, and this stuck out to me. I remember that we were like, oh, y'all plan on having more kids. And they lived in New York City, and they said, no, we just, we don't have the space. That was their determining factor is to have more children. Right. That's they exactly have a place what to put them. And when they're young, sometimes you can kind of pile them in. We had some friends who built a bunk that was like three bunks high, yeah. <laughs> which was crazy. I'm like, yeah. don't fall off the top. I know, right? But, um, but then some, usually when they get to that third child or fourth child, that that's usually like, can we stay? That's when the question, can mm. we stay, gets really loud. So then you kind of have to leave the city and someone has to commute if you work in the city, right? That's kind of your yes. option. Yeah, it is. It is. Mm. There's a lot of trains in and out from Jersey or Connecticut or, you know, Long Island. But yes, everyone has to make that decision mm. um, when it gets to that point. Hey guys, thanks for listening to my chat with Rebecca. Uh, Before we get back to the show, I want to thank another one of our our partners for the show, and that is Prep Dish. Prep Dish is a meal planning service who their whole mission is to make our lives easier. They want us to work more efficiently, and they want us to create good meals for ourselves and for our families. The way Prep Dish works is that every week you're going to get a weekly email from Allison, and she has created a meal plan for you. She gives you a grocery list, so you can take that list with you to the grocery store, check things off that you need, and then you come home and you spend a couple of hours, two to three hours, prepping your meals. So you prep them all, and then every single day, she lays out exactly what you need to do to get that meal on the table for your family. All the hard work is already done. You did it that one day. Right now, Prep Dish is offering a special deal to all you Happy Hour listeners, a $4 trial for a month. That's a dollar a week for someone to help you create great meals for your family. Go to prepdish.com slash happy hour. That's all lowercase. Prepdish.com slash happy hour and get your good deal. Okay, back to my conversation with Rebecca. Well, so your book, um, I read chapter seven, if that rings a bell to you. This morning, I randomly just opened it um, and it's called Free to Begin Again. And it talks about you guys moving to New York City. Um, and then it talks about how long were you guys in the city? Four and a half years. Four and a half years. Um, Mm -hmm. And then it talks about how you kind of felt it was time to go. And as I was reading it, I was thinking to myself, this, this is, this translates to so many different areas of our life, not like moving cities, Mm -hmm. but just how is it sometimes that we feel as though it's time to move on to something next? Yeah. Um, And I think sometimes we kind of maybe over examine it or make it a big deal, but it sounds to me like you guys just kind of every year you laid it out and said, are we good here? And then all of a sudden things started happening where you just kind of went, I think this is God showing me it's time to move on. Um, And a lot of those for you guys revolved around your kids. Yeah. Our kids let us out for sure. Yeah. For sure. If if, if it were up to me, I would still be skipping around um, Tribeca right now. Mm -hmm. And, And it's not because I feel like the martyr mama. I just knew that, uh, the Lord had us there for a season. And then I also knew that he, he wouldn't call us to minister in a way that would um, abandon our family. Like, mm-hmm. like, do you know what I'm saying? Like, everyone has to flourish ultimately, and I'm only one of five. So that was, those were the things we had to discuss, especially that last year when Kate got in middle school and it got harder and harder. And so you, <laughs> I, I, I giggle, and I don't know if you can giggle about it now, but when you were talking about Cade making himself sick at school, yes, I was like, what a smart kid, first of all. I know. He's like, listen, I don't want to be here. I know what I need to do. Done. I'm, gonna, I'm just like, I can spit up on demand and go to the nurse's office and they will send me home every day, which was brilliant. I right. mean, he's, brilliant. He's so, so smart. If only his siblings had picked up on that. I mean, we would have right. all been out of there by January. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, 
go into that story in that chapter. It's, it's kind of comical looking back, but I'm just like, how in the world did he get away with that? Right. Was Cade the one that was suffering the most? In that season, yes. Yeah. Um, the, the other two were a close second, but I would say he for sure. We, we, he moved to middle school. The, it was a different school downtown, and the, there was not at all the special needs support that we had had in elementary uptown. Mm-hmm. And and I just could see the writing on the wall. I was looking ahead, you know. I was like, these are the years where we're trying to prepare him for full independence and job, like to transition into job and maybe college or whatever that looks like for him. And this is not going to get us there. Yeah. So yeah. you just knew you had to make a change. Yes, we did. We did. He, we felt like that before and changes for us. It was like a school wide thing. I remember a couple of years ago, um, one of my kids who probably struggles the most in school, we just kind of looked around and thought this is not the best place for him. Um, and for us, too, it's kind of very different, but the same. We were living in kind of an, in an underprivileged neighborhood. We loved our neighborhood um, and we were sending our kids to the local school. And we kind of felt like we want to be a part of the change. We want to see the school get the same funding all the other schools get, you know, all these things we wanted. But then we looked at our son and thought, he's not going to thrive here like this. And so I had to think, do I want to just like take one for the team? But then I'm like, no, it's my kid. Like, I can't take one for the team for my son. And so we found a different school. But I remember feeling like, am I abandoning the call that you put on our lives, God? Did you go through that at all? Yes. uh, And I wrestled with that a little bit in the chapter where... I thought, you know, I really encountered, it's interesting, the narrative of the book is that I left the Bible Belt of the South and went to New York, and when I did, God got really loud, and and Jesus became real in ways that I had never really fully grasped when it was comfortable to be Christian or everyone was quote-unquote Christian. It, it was like so peculiar to be a Christian in New York, mm-hmm. and people all my non-Christian friends up there would lean in and be curious. They're like, wait, you love God and you love Jesus and you're an evangelical. They're like, I, or you're someone who <laughs> claims Christ. Like I've never known anyone like that. Right. Why are you here? So it's almost like you had this freedom to talk about God from a fresh perspective that wasn't tainted by cultural norm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it, it was a new season of faith for me and God, became so dear. And when it came time to leave, I thought, okay, Lord, I feel like you got really loud on the floorboards of my apartment in the sky. You know, this little box of windows in the sky, this tiny one that we're all sharing. Mm -hmm. And I was afraid that once I went back to Christian Bell or somewhere that was a little more culturally Southern or everyone's fine and friendly. that Bible Belt. I mean, you know, (laughs) yes, that's what it is. That, that he would not join me, that mm-hmm. I would just be like going back south. And he's like, well, that was fun while yeah. it lasted, uh-huh. you know? And so there was a fear there and I had to really, uh, and I talk about it in that chapter. Um, and God just reminded me like your identity was never in this city mm-hmm. and, your, and your journey of healing and restoration or finding your voice. I found my voice in New York. I mm-hmm. found my, I even wakened more to my purpose and call out of the pain that I experienced there. And God's like, I used this as a setting because I knew it would get your attention, but Mm -hmm. it's not that I only dwell here. So come on. (laughs) Yeah. You even said like, he is our home. So you were kind of feeling like I can experience the same thing in Nashville. Yes. But it didn't come without those questions. And I think we all have those when transition is around the bend. We're always afraid, like, will we lose something in this risk? Mm. Uh, Will it be? worth it? Will we, will we know if we made the right decision or not a year from now or two? And I guess what I learned in that process is if the prompting is there and you can't shake it and it feels clear and you and your spouse are in agreement on it and it just, then you kind of have to step in blind faith like we always do, right? And trust that God is leading us somewhere and he's not going to just kind of like leave us out to dry. Mm. It's really good. And it feels like you're saying to me, like, like that God became so clear and loud um, and you met him in a new, a new, fresh way in a season that was sometimes more difficult than, than your pace of life here in Nashville. But it's like it took that for you yeah. to grasp a hold of him in a new way. 
Absolutely. Just more <sighs> desperate. Yeah. I think I was just more desperate on a daily basis. And out of that desperation, I cried out more. And what I know about God is He doesn't deny a heart that's expectant. Mm. And so the more we come to Him with our yearning and our honesty, even if it's full of fear and doubt, but it's honest, um, He meets us there. Mm. And and shows up in ways that we might not have seen if we just kind of avoid him altogether. So how, so how does that translate back to your life now? Like, how do you keep, like, I use the word momentum, and I mean, you know how I mean it. Like, how do you translate that to coming back and living in the South? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, when I got back here, I did get quiet for a while. I entered the next chapter, I think, is on rest after the one you read, or free to wait and then free to rest. Okay. Uh huh. And and so I had to. People were like, "I think you're entering a season of rest," and I'm like, "I don't want to rest. I just mm. got running." Right. Hebrews, <laughs> Hebrews twelve. People, let's, let's go. Run the race. Yes. Like, and it did. Um, felt humbling. It felt like I got benched or I tripped in my lane, and everyone kept running. And I think God was just saying, you know, let's just get quiet. And that's when this inner healing journey really began. And the, the content of the book started to really take shape in these journals. I started The Artist Way and I would journal mm. every morning, three pages on average. For, and so a full journal every year. I had like four, like, and, and so it's almost like what started in New York out of intimacy was given space to grow in Franklin in a mm. quiet way. And because I was new to the city, I didn't feel like I had to meet these social obligations. I mm -hmm. could just kind of be anonymous and yeah. kind of go on the road and do what I'd been asked to do and then come back home and slowly make friends, but not jump into everything. And, um, and now we've been here two and a half years and it's become more clear. Like the Lord put planted things in my heart in that season for women, like convening women citywide. Mm -hmm. And what would it look like for us to unite a bunch of churches together? And now that's something we're doing called the well. We just started a few months ago. It's so, so sweet things have slowly surfaced mm -hmm. showing confirmation as to why we're here. Um, but I think in that early days, that first year, even into that second year, it was just like God just saying, just trust me, mm. just trust me. This is where I have you. You can rest in that. You don't have to see it all. It doesn't have to all make sense to you. Just, and my prayer early on was like, don't show me like six months down the road, but maybe like a week. Come on, give me <laughs> <Or> something. <laughs> give me a month, right. maybe. Because like, the control freak in me wants to kind of see how it all plays right. out. And yet everything, obviously, looking backwards will be clear. But part of the point of faith is that we're not supposed to know it all. Mm. And we're supposed to be okay with that. Re Rebecca, it's, he did the same thing when you moved to New York City. I mean, I'm listening and I'm like, it's so amazing <laughs> how God is that you, I'm sure you felt those same feelings just different when you yeah. moved into this new, crazy New York City life. Um, and then it just kind of translated a little bit different. But he was doing the same thing again. Of like, okay, just trust me. Just yeah. trust me. And I love that. It's so, yeah. I love seeing that. Like, no matter what season that we are, it's like God saying the same thing to us. Just trust yes. me, you know? Um, oh, yes. Love it. Okay, so you are free, be who you already are. It um, came out yesterday, so you guys need to go grab a copy. I'll have a link on my webpage if you need it. Um, as I always tell authors, thank you for putting your words out there. It means a lot. Um, oh. Okay, Rebecca, let's talk, let's talk some fun things. What are you reading okay. right now? Okay, um... Well, I'm reading not enough right now because I'm keeping up right now. Yeah. But I have a couple books by my bed that I keep referring to. And one of them is, <laughs> it's, it's not like light reading, but I love reading just an excerpt here and there. And so it's called Come Be My Light. It's it's what I read sometimes before I go to sleep. And it's mm -hmm. these journals of Mother Teresa. And you can, I think she's okay with it because you can buy it on Amazon. Okay. So, okay. Um, but it's just her... You know, it's like what I was just talking about a minute ago, like those conversations she had with Jesus in journals um, showed how sweet their relationship was. Mm. Um, I don't know. It, she said some really uh, remarkable things in there that I've just tucked away. Like one was, if someone's not full of joy, it's because they're refusing something to Jesus. They're holding on to something that they should actually not, they were never meant to carry. And I mean, things like that. Wow. Were, the melancholic like me, I was like, oh, oh my goodness. Like, what am I holding on to that I'm not supposed to be carrying? Right. Uh, so little nuggets like that. I love just, you know, reading books by dead people. So anyways. <laughs> that's a good thing to note. Um, 
Okay, what are you loving these days? What are three things that you're loving that you just want to tell your girlfriends about? Um, okay, well, I love, um, there's this makeup palette. <laughs> yes. We're going to go there. Um, I love it. It's, it's like a three shimmer palette, and now I'm going to need to remember the name of it. I heard about it from Angie Smith, and she just raved, and it kind of makes you look like like dewy and glowy a little bit uh -huh. and um, you can get it at Sephora. Okay. Um, and what is it called? I love oh, that you were in your bathroom right now looking for it. I am looking for it. I'm like, where did it go? Where did it go? Um, it's so good. It's so good though. Cause I will get it to you because it's so good. Okay. What else are you loving? Um, I'm always loving hats. I don't know why. You know what it is? It's because I'm too lazy to do my hair. And so <laughs> all summer, it'll be a straw hat. All winter, it'll be a beanie. Sometimes in the fall, it'll be like a felt, you know, uh -huh. fedora or whatever. But I pretty much wear hats. In fact, it got to be a joke in Franklin, like with people I'm meeting, they're like, I didn't recognize you without your hat on. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Now, do you wear baseball hats or is that not your thing? I, I do not enough, but I did this week and Gabe's like, why don't you wear baseball hats more? I'm like, because I just don't think about it. But basically, yes, I will wear okay. anything. That's the only kind of hat I own that I would wear. I, I yeah. Hats make me a little nervous. I don't know. I, I never think I can pull it off. I don't know <laughs> oh, why. You totally can, girl. <laughs> I mean, I can pull off a baseball hat, but that's because I don't like to do my hair either. So there's that. Yeah. Um, okay. So what's another thing you're loving? Um. I love This Is Us, yes. Oh, yes, uh-huh. Oh, goodness, yes. Um, I have to kind of pace myself on it because I have, a, like, an ugly cry about every other session, every oh, other no. episode. But I do love just how it connects the dots. And probably because I think this way, I always like to connect the dots from childhood to adulthood mm. on why we are the way we are and why our interactions with our siblings are the way they are or even our friends or whatever, like, it's always like the why behind the, the what. Yeah. So I just love that psychology <laughs> and it's just beautifully shot. So I love the, the show as well. We're way behind, so I can't like yeah, literally it, the last scene I saw was at the karate class. And so I don't know yes. if you've seen, I bawled my eyes out through that scene. Um, yes. That's the last episode that we've seen. But whenever I'm watching it, Rebecca, I always like, it's interesting that you said about the connection between the childhood. Whenever I watch it, I sometimes find myself thinking, what are my children? Because I have four. Like, what are their, what's their sibling relationship going to be like when they're older? I know. And I know. It's sometimes it's like, oh, my gosh, am I affecting? Because we are. I mean, we, we are affecting it. You know, we're their greatest teacher right now. So I sometimes mm -hmm. find myself thinking, am I doing it all wrong? Am I doing anything right? Are they going to love each other when they're older? Oh, I want, the, I want my kids to be best friends. Like, that's my dream. It's like the Bravermans. I want everyone to come home. <laughs> you know, and have Sunday dinner um, at my house. Right. And so I find myself thinking about almost kind of parenting my kids to be siblings, to be friends when I'm watching right. the show. I know. I know. It's Ugh. interesting because I do find myself going last night at our quote unquote non-Valentine's dinner. Yes. <laughs> I was like, let's everyone go around and tell each other why you love each other. And I'll be like, I'll be like, Kennedy, you still haven't told Pierce or Pierce, you need to right. tell you. <laughs> be nice. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm like controlling the kind things they say. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and they're like, okay, mom. Oh. So yes. It's I good. I mean, you. I heard one time, and I tell my kids they've heard this a lot. I heard someone say one time that your siblings, you know, barring anything tragic happening with your family or your spouse, like your siblings will be in a lot of cases the old, the longest relationship you have on earth. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? Because uh, yeah. you'll know them. And most, I mean, everyone has random situations when like their mom had them like twenty years after their oldest brother, or whatever. In most <laughs> cases, you mm -hmm. will know them the longest. Yes, That's crazy. I always tell them and remind them, especially when they're fighting over the front seat or whatever <laughs> yes. on the way after school. I'm like, you're going to always have each other, whether or not you to each to. other, <laughs> <laughs> always have each other. That's one yeah. of my biggest regrets. I'm four years older than my brother, and I wish I just would have been kinder to him when I was in high school. Yes, I feel the same. He was in I'm middle saying. school and elementary, and I just I wanted nothing to do with him. And I wish so badly I could go back and change that. Well, because when we're kids, we really are just not thinking about the other person. <laughs> no, we are only yeah. looking out for ourselves. We're like, yeah, we're like, I want my space and yep. this is my room and I want the biggest piece of cake. Yep. And 
Stop following me and my friends around. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And don't look at me. Stop looking at me and stop touching yeah. me. Yes. All of the things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. And it's like, what could my, I, mean, I always think to myself, like, I, that's one of my biggest regrets. And I want my kids to love each other. And I think that we just keep doing what you're doing is we make them be kind to each other and we control their kind words <laughs> to each other and make sure they're being kind to each other. Yeah. I mean, that's all you can that's do. That's all really. we can do, right? It's all <laughs> we like, can force do. Force hug. Force yes. hug right now. <laughs> yes. Hug it out. <laughs> Family night. Everyone's happy. That's what we're like. Everyone's going to be together. Oh. Uh, well, Rebecca, it's been so fun having you on the happy hour and oh, you. such a joy and your book is beautiful and I can't wait to dive in and, and read more um, than just chapter seven. So it gave me a really big itch to read more. So thank you for putting your words out there and thank you Absolutely. for champion women to believe, to believe what he said, you know, to yep. believe him to be true. And so, yes, we are free it. indeed. So thank you so much. Um, Enjoy. Oh, I didn't even, we didn't even talk about, just give me a small snippet, like, cause we're out of time. You're about okay. to hit the road. Yes. Uh, so when this airs, yes, tomorrow it will be the 20, the first night of a tour with Ann Voskamp and Christy Knuckles. It's called the Broken and Free Tour. And we're in, I think, 11 cities. Yes. It's at brokenandfreetour.com. So, so anyways, if we're in your area, that'd be so fun. <sighs> Okay, well, um, I'll put the link on my webpage, and if you see her coming close to you, you got to go. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Three amazing ladies, super fun. Okay, Rebecca, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Jamie. Have an awesome day. Guys, thanks for listening to today's show. I love chatting with Rebecca. Um, I love her heart for women and for her family and for her community around her. Um, it was such a great conversation. And if you're looking to get her book, you are free. There's a link for it on my webpage, jamieivy.com. I want to thank our last partner for the show today, and that is the book, The Heart of Marriage by Don Camp. The best marriages are not perfect. Marriage is about walking together through all of life's ups and downs, its challenges and triumphs. Collecting true stories from some of today's best writers, Don Camp invites you to reflect on the heart of marriage. With beautiful photographs and poignant prose, this collection is perfect for the good days, the hard days, and all the days in between. This book includes stories written from Crystal Payne, Lisa Jo Baker, Alexander Kirkendall, Holly Gerth, Renee Swope, Richard Paul Evans, Kristen Welch, Mo Isom, and so many more. Be sure and look for the book, The Heart of Marriage, and you can find that at Barnes & Nobles or Amazon. Guys, last week I told you that the Saturday show for the Happy Hour Live was sold out. Um, and it is. It's sold out. No more tickets available. Um, but we have opened up some more tickets. And so I saw someone the other day, and they're like, I bought a ticket for Saturday, and now my friend can't get some. How does she come? And I was like, I think I need to open up some more tickets. So we're going to open up some more tickets to Saturday night. So if you wanted to come and Saturday was the only night that you could make it, now's your chance. But once these are gone, I promise you they are gone. So go over to jamieivy.com slash events and get your tickets for those events. We are so excited. They are right around the corner. Literally, they're two and a half weeks away. So you still have a chance to get you some tickets. Next week, my guest is Joy Egrich reed And I had so much fun chatting with her. She's hilarious and brilliant and witty. And she's moving next week to Paris with her husband. How dreamy is that? I learned so much about the world of improv comedy, which that was a first for me. And I didn't plan on learning so much. And at the end of our conversation, I asked her a question that I love to ask at dinner parties. And you should hear her squirm. Today's show is edited by Logan Garza. And the music is from Jason Poe. Guys, enjoy your week. Share the show with a girlfriend and have a happy hour with a friend. I'll see you guys next week.